Hi, good morning, everybody. So, could you, uh, the panelists of uh, all our session, uh, all panelists of our session, come to sit on the front? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining our session on Christ climate and sustainable development board commitments to action on the ground, scaling up the contribution of forest, sustainable forest products, and climate resilient land use. We also thank CIFO and uh, thank donors of the Global Landscape Forum Kyoto for giving us this opportunity to hold this panel session. We have six panelists already from here, uh, come here. So from international organizations, research institutes, and the private sectors. So objective of this panel session is to share experiences of panelists on initiatives to increase contribution of forest and forest products and land use to help meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the targets established by the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and to consider how better we can work to achieve these goals and targets on time. Our session will last for one hour from now. After the six presentations, we will have some panel talks. If time allows, we may take some questions. However, we are sorry if not enough time left at the end. Before starting the presentations, I would like to introduce our speakers very shortly. Because of the time constraints, please refer to a short biography for each speaker on the website of GLF Kyoto. First gentleman on my right is Dr. Gerhard Dittare, Executive Director of the International Vertical Timber Organization, IPTO. Next is Dr. Haruto Sawada, President of the Forest Research and Management Organization, FRMO, and Director General of Forestry and Forest Product Research Institute, FFPRI. Next already is, ah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kanako Morita, from United Nations University Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability. She is a senior researcher for FFPRI2. And uh, so back on the left-hand side of uh, Dr. Kanako Morita is uh, Mr. Hedon Santoso, Vice President, Vice Chairman of the Chicago Foundation from the Republic of Indonesia. The foundation is a partner of Kanemats Corporation, a private company of Japan. The rightmost is Mr. Takahiro Morita. Sorry. So he is Senior Deputy Director General and Group Director for Forestry and Natural Conservation, Global Environmental Department, Japan International Corporation Agency. And uh, so, uh, here, next, uh, next left hand side of uh, Mr. Takahiro Morita is Dr. Brian Johnson, research manager of Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, ISIS. So, uh, so let us begin the presentation. Each speaker has seven minutes. So now the first speaker is Dr. Gerhard Dittare. Executive Director of ITTO, you have a floor. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here with you in, in the city of Kyoto, which is one of the foremost uh, cities in the world on link in linking culture, nature, and sustainable urban life. And we are also proud to be here um, as a host of the government of Japan um, um, for our organization, which is based in Yokohama. And um, ITTO is an organization which uh, is <coughs> um, 
constituted of 74 member states and its goal is uh, to promote trade with products from forests which are coming from sustainable and legal sources and um, half of them are coming from tropical countries, producer countries and half of them come from consumer countries including Japan. And I would like to raise one uh, specific aspect in the, in the global climate change agenda which is the role of productive forests which has been overlooked a little bit over the last 10 years but IPCC recently raised this point very very strongly and saying without the role of productive forests and the use of forest products we cannot achieve the 1.5 temperature increase goal because we have to look towards a circular economy and a bio-based economy and as I have only seven minutes, I would like to uh, only uh, give you some uh, quick snapshots of, uh, of our approach at ITTO uh, based on some pictures. Uh, so if you can move forward to the, to the presentation. <coughs> So look at this graphic. Um, this is the situation of population growth from now to 2100. And you will see uh, we will, the overall population growth will be happening mostly in Africa. About 3 billion people more in Africa, more than in any other continent. We have at the same time, we see that uh, there is not only deforestation going on in, uh, through this graphic, but also large degradation in, in the world around massive of forests in Amazon, in the Congo Basin, in, in, uh, in, in the Southeast Asia and so on. So it's not only the deforestation from outside, it's also something which happens inside the forest. And this has to do with population growth. And you, for Africa, for example, you see the projected supply deficit uh, in, in the next 50, uh, 30 years and we have to see that people need wood and wood based product the same way they, they need f food so we cannot only talk about food security we have to talk about wood security and uh, it's almost 99% correlation between the increase of demand for wood based products and population growth and if you look at where we can, um, let me say it a different way, we only can uh, uh, provide this additional de uh, uh, supply, this demand for forest products if we look at investments into forests. If we don't manage to produce sufficiently sustainable wood and timber, we will not achieve the climate goals. We have more ingression into protected areas, we will have more degradation, we will have more deforestation because people will take what it needs. And if you look at this graphic, it's quite clear. If you are lucky in 2050, we can keep the level of primary forest as it is if you protect them because we need them for biodiversity services and other global public good services. So the bulk of what we need in the future has to come through investments and uh, it has to come through active reforestation and, the forest and reforestation. And this is where also we can produce forest products which are sustainable and which provide the, the additional substitution effects for replacing other materials which are not renewable. So this is a very important part of the global climate change agenda in the future. But together, these sustainable management and sustainable use of forests can contribute to economic growth, to a circular or bioeconomy. It produces climate change benefits and many other sustainable development goals as seen on the right side of the, of the chart. So what are we doing in our organization? Among many other things, we promote sustainable investments 
because governments can do a lot through revised taxation policies, to fiscal incentives, to other subsidies, to promote those investors who want to be sustainable. And, and I think there are many possibilities which are not used yet. We need to look at all, also at our restoration guidelines, because in the past we have only or mainly looked at carbon and biodiversity and, and other benefits, but we also need to look at the economic aspect of investments, because if the landscape restoration is not done in a sustainable way, which provides benefits for people and income for people, we will not be successful. And we are working in a part, new partnership with an initiative from China. The 18 biggest companies in China, uh, uh, trading about 18 billion US dollars, have committed themselves to move towards legal and sustainable or green supply chains. And we are hoping to create together with them as a starting point a global platform, uh, a global green supply chain platform in which tropical producers and other producers can participate. And that this is the first big initiative by the private sector itself and which has a strong possibility to supplement government activities and also stimulate new government policies and so on. But legal and sustainable supply chains are not an easy thing to achieve because from the tree in the forest to the shelf, uh, to the product on the sh in, the, in the market, uh, there are many transformation stages and so on. So products are mixed together, they are uh, uh, made as composites and, and so on. So it is important if you want to claim sustainability for a product and make it account, counting for climate change benefit, we need to have proof of the entire supply chain from the forest to the end market. And um, there are so many difficulties, many uh, hands change the product and so on, that we see this as, a, as our main uh, task in the future, to link producers and consumers through information, to training, capacity building, and uh, platforms for legal and sustainable supply chains. And with that, I would like to thank you, and um, looking forward for a lively discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitaraj. So we learned about the various roles of IPTO to promote the sustainable investment and the reforestation through the guidelines and the network and capacity building. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is from Research Institute of Japan, President Dr. Sawada from FFBRI. Please start your presentation.
percent of Japan is covered with forest, and most of our studies focus on forest under these diverse environment conditions. However, over mature plantation and aging society, the sustainability of salmon forest management in Japan. Next, please. Oh, okay. This way. Okay. Uh, our uh, science scientific findings have used for forest management in Japan and some countries, but global environment changes became big issues, as you know, even in the forest of the world. Therefore, we strengthen fitting our researches for addressing global environment issues, including the UN SDGs. I'd like to uh, briefly show some examples. Is on, on this point. The first one is the development of forest management technologies for utilization of forest function to fulfill expecting functions through a socio or economic forest management system. Integration of new and existing knowledge is essential for this activity. We think uh, these studies are closely related to the goals, uh, 10 goals of SDGs. The second one is development of sustainable forest system for stable supply of, of forest products to achieve domestic timber supply. Actionable methods and technologies for Practitioners are required in forest management and timber harvest. The third one is development of wood and woody resource utilization technologies to produce new woody materials and to extract new material from timber. The cross laminated timber cellulose nanofiber and polyethylene glycol modified glycol lignin are such examples. Interdisciplinary collaboration has made it possible to uh, develop industrial raw materials from timber. The fourth example is the development of neutralization technology of forest organisms and the breeding technologies to promote the utilization of fungi, for example, mustache mushroom, and the plantation of superior tree varieties, for example, H tree of Sugi, Japanese cedar. The fifth group is forest management activities and forest insurance services to manage headwater forests as a public safety net and to cover uh, damages of private policy caused by uh, natural disasters. Science advisory mechanisms are important for these activities. And as a conclusion of my presentation, we contribute to achieve SDGs as outlined uh, here, such as development of science and technology on forest forestry and forest products, revitalization of forest forestry, forest products industries and community, establishment of science advisory team systems which support research, development and education on sustainable ecological systems and promotion of international partnerships and studies on world poverty and inequality. We do hope that this session is informative for our future activities.
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Samada. So we learned uh, how so FPRs work to SDGs it's comprehensively. Thank you very much. Next speaker is uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Morita from UNUIAS FFBRI. She will talk about the importance of incorporating forest related measures into governance for SDGs. Dr. Morita, please start your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, my uh, main affiliation is actually FFPRI, but today I'm going to uh, represent my other affiliation, United Nations University IAS, and I would like to share my view and my work on related to the governance for SDGs. So as you all are aware, um, the two international environmental commitments, um, climate change commitments under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and the Sustainable Development Goals commitments, um, both have um, contributed in enhancing um, forest-related measures, including climate change mitigation, such as reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries, climate change adaptation in the forest sector, and broader um, sustainable forest management and also um, zero deforestation commitments. And so the two, um, the two environmental commitments are very important in enhancing um, forest-related measures that contribute to the sustainable development. Um, in the forest community, I feel that the, the main discussion on the SDGs are um, Try to uh, mapping the existing forest-related measures to, into the sustainable development goals. For example, like the reducing the how the red plus linked to the goal 13 or 15, 6 or so on. But there are less discussion on how the overall the cross-sectoral governance for SDG can enhance the forest-related measure and what kind of transformation are necessar necessary for the existing governance for the forest sector. So I'm currently uh, working with the UNU IAS and studying on the governance um, system for the SDG at, the dip at international and national and local level. And there are active um, discussion on the, the, the more, building more effective governance system at all levels. Like for example, at international level, there are a lot of discussion on the governance system at, under the high level political forum, like, such as like multi, the way of the uh, engagement of the multi-stakeholders. And also at the national local level, many countries um, develop the national strategies and plans for the SDGs and local initiatives for SDGs. And for example, in Japan, Japan has newly established the SDG implementation guiding principles and action plans. And also at the local level, um, Japan has um, newly, established it, newly established the SDG Future Cities project. So um, I think that it is more, uh, it is not, um, it is important to discuss not only mapping the forest related activity to the SDGs, but also um, um, discuss more on the, how the effective way to incorporate forest related measures to the governance, um, governance discussion for the SDGs. So um, at the UNUIAS, um, some case studies um, 
including the cases of Japan and Indonesia. So I would like to um, show our part of our, our research results. Um, we we compare the governance systems for SDG in Japan and Indonesia by using the matrix tool to evaluate the governance system for SDGs. And what we found is that in two countries, both countries um, have the but have a mechanism to coordinate um, government ministries to achieve the SDGs and also the both countries improve the coordination among ministries and also with the other stakeholders to achieve SDGs. But the structure of the governance of two countries were different. Like, this is because, for example, in Japan, Japan created a new governance system for SDGs and engaging a lot of non-state actors in the process. And, but, uh, Japan doesn't ha does not have a legal system focusing on SDGs. On the other hand, Indonesia developed a governance, governance system for SDG based on the governance system created for the, created for the Millennium Development Goals and they have a newly established legal framework. So, um, so there are um, differences between the governance system in different countries. And my message is that it is important to understand the discussion of these governance um, system for SDGs and also the different characteristics of the governance for SDG in different countries and try to find the effective way to incorporate these forest related elements into the governance discussion. So that's all for me and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Morita. Her presentation about uh, so the governance system to uh, incorporate uh, the international fora is very uh, interesting, and uh, I think it is very useful for policymakers. So now we have next speaker from IGES, a research and development institute, Dr. Johnson. You have a floor. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to any moms watching from the other side of the world. My mom too. She's watching. <laughs> okay, so my name is Brian. I'm from IDIS, uh, based in Japan. Okay, please start the slideshow. So today I'm presenting about uh, one project we have going on in the Philippines uh, to related to climate resilient uh, land use. So we use some participatory methods and also some uh, uh, GIS remote sensing techniques for the uh, climate resilient uh, land use planning. So I'll just explain first the study site. So it's uh, five watersheds about uh, 40 kilometers from Manila. So there's about uh, one million people and the population is growing rapidly. Uh, this lake here is the uh, Laguna de Bay Lake. It's the biggest lake in the Philippines and one of the biggest lakes in uh, Southeast Asia. So it's an important source of water. Um, one problem in this area is there's a rapid land use change. So there's a growing population and economy. Um, a lot of land is being converted from here, you can see the orange areas, those are agroforestry areas, and then the green is forest, and then the yellow is uh, agricultural areas. So it's being converted to urban lands at a rapid rate. So we want to see what are the impacts of these land use changes and try to help the local governments to uh, better plan their future land use changes uh, to reduce uh, water-related hazards, so flood risk and also the water quality issues. Okay, so this is just uh, some pictures of the typical landscapes of the area. So from the from the mountainous area, you can see there's a banana and uh, other kinds of uh, fruit plantations. And then if you go closer to the lake, uh, traditionally it was almost all uh, rice paddies in agriculture. And then along the rivers, uh, you can see the people use the, the rivers for washing their clothes, and there's some springs near the rivers where they get their water. Um, so this is the traditional use of the, the landscape, and now it's uh, being converted to the urban areas, and you see some problems. Uh, like flooding, this is after a typhoon a few years ago. Um, but they face flooding issues almost every year. And then there's also uh, water quality issues and also flood hazard due to people uh, building their homes and informal settlements right along the river banks. Okay, so uh, the project we have four step approach. Uh, so first we uh, meet with local governments. So we work at the watershed level. So there's usually more than one local government, more than one city in a in a watershed, so we invite all the different uh, municipalities to meeting and then 
we have them do participatory land use uh, mapping. So we try to understand what's the future land use of the area based on their plans. And then uh, based on these future land use changes, we do uh, hydrological modeling. So we want to understand the future uh, flood risk um, and then the future water quality, considering the land use change and also climate change. And then uh, we meet with the local governments again, we present the, the findings of this uh, risk assessment. And then we ask them to develop some countermeasures. So each uh, government will develop their own countermeasures. And then as, at the watershed level, they try to identify some priority countermeasures. Right, because the plans of one local government also affect the other one. So if an uh, uh, upstream municipality doesn't uh, have any kind of uh, controls, then the downstream areas, they're going to face more flooding. So we try to identify some countermeasures at the watershed level. It's not always easy. But uh, then finally, the fourth step is we try to uh, get the local governments to uh, streamline these uh, countermeasures into their development plans. So their climate change action plans or their land use plans. Okay, I just show some pictures of the process. So this is the... Uh, participatory mapping is basically pretty low tech. We just print out a, a big poster and we ask them to draw their land use plans on the map and then they present it to us and the other local governments. And then second, uh, this is the output of a risk assessment so we can see the, the current and then the future uh, flood extent and also the water quality um, at different parts of the river. So uh, upstream, midstream, downstream. And then, so we present these results to local governments and then they try to get their feedback and countermeasures. So here's an example of some common measures they identify. So some are related to zoning enhancement, uh, to alleviate the flood risk, some are related to river rehabilitation, so um, increasing the water retaining capacity and the water quality of the river. And then the, also some capacity development issues. Okay, so these are the different local governments have their own uh, countermeasures. And then finally, uh, we target these uh, land use plans, so we, sometimes we need to meet with the consultants that are drafting these plans and the local governments that are drafting these plans. So in the Philippines, there are some good uh, examples of plans, so every uh, local government has to make a comprehensive land use plan for about the next uh, 10 years, roughly. And then also they, they need to prepare a local climate change action plans. So we try to get the countermeasures and policy, into these policies. Okay, so I'll just explain the project timeline. So we started in 2014. Uh, basically, this was a piloting phase. So we, we worked in one, um, one watershed, and uh, the, the result that we were happy to get was uh, one uh, the big city, uh, Santa Rosa City, they, they improved their land use plans and climate change action plans using these project results. So then based on that, we scaled up the project to another four watersheds. So that's about 16 local governments. Um, and then starting this year, we are trying to hand off the project because we can't go on forever. We want to, but we can't. So um, we provide training to the, the local government and also the well, national government agencies, so Laguna Lake Development Authority. Um, we try to train them on the methodology and uh, hope that this can help with the further scaling of the project to the whole lake basin and also the continuation of the project um, in future years, so for future land use plans. Okay, uh, that's all I have, so thank you very much. I just showed some delicious uh, Filipino food. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. We learned about the importance of capacity building and uh, to promote the coordination among uh, various stakeholders. Thank you very much. Next, we have a speaker from a private sector. <clears throat> Indonesia, Matsushita Gobel Foundation, Kushachono, Papa Heru Santos Sandis. Papa Heru San, you wish to only get a shimas. ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
あのやっぱりインドネシアにあのぜひ守りたいなと思いますインドネシアは1万6000の島々からなり東西約5000キロの広さでございますジャカルタから大阪東部あの距離だと思っておりましてあの小さはですねあの3つございましてどこにこの辺は日本と同じ時間帯でございますあの本日はですねご紹介するプロジェクトの事業者であります松下ゴベル財団について少し説明させていきたいと思いますこの財団はもともとモハマッド・ゴーベル氏と松下幸之助氏により1979年設立されたわけでございます財団の目的はイノイシアの人々の生活を改善することですあの今年はですね松下とこのゴーベルとの合弁は59年のパートナーシップに入ろうとしております現会長のランマル・ゴーベル氏は元商業大臣で現在ジョコビ大統領政権の直下で直轄で日本特別大使として任務されておりますゴーベル氏は母親の思いあの引き継ぎ物を作る前にまず人を作ると活動を実践しておりますマシタゴーベルは日本の商社の金松と協力しまして2011年からゴロンタロ州で森林保全プロジェクトを実施してまいりましたインドネシア東部のセレベストにゴロンタロ州がありますこのゴロンタロでは森林伐採,伐採が大きな環境問題を吹き起こしております大雨が降ると森林が雨水を吸収できず下流域に洪水が頻繁に発生しておりますまた雨水と一緒に山の土砂が大量にリンボト湖に投げ込み湖がどんどん浅くなっております専門家によりますとあと10年この湖が消えていくなくなってしまうと言っています衛星画像を見ても湖が小さくなっている姿がお借りいただいておりますゴロンタロー州の衛星画像で森林伐採の,あの進行状況を見てみましょう1990年2000年2010年人口の増加と伴って森林の面積がどんどん減少して肌色の面積が増えているのがよくわかると思っております実際に現地を見ますと左の写真のように急斜面の場所さえ木々があのすっかりと伐採されて一面トモロコシの地になっておりますこれがゴロンタロ州における CO2 排出の原因なのですトモロコシ農業が森林伐採の原因なのですが自分たちの家計のために重要な産業ですから農家および政府を責めることはできませんしかし農家と現地政府ともに何か改善する対策を考えて実施しなければならないと思っておりますそこで私たち日本政府のご支援いただいてましてプロジェクト活動を開始したのがわけでございます貧困層によるトモロコシ農業がどのように環境に悪い影響を与えているんでしょうか農家は貧困から抜き出したいのですがより多くの農地を開拓したいと考えますそれで急斜面でさえ森林を伐採してトモロコシあの農地に変えてしておりますしかしながら急斜面では余分を十分に保つことができなくてトモロコシの生産性が悪くなりその結果あの貧困から抜け,る抜け出すことができないということわけでございますこれが悪循環が続くわけでございますそこで私たちゴロンタル州のボラエモ州であの推進しているのはより収益の高いカカオ農業です一つ,一つは農家の人たちのカカオ農業の方法を指導することと二つ目は金松とともに日本のチョコレート市場に向けた新しいバリューチェーンを作ることでございますこれからの活動により私たち森林の保全して CO2 排出を削減そしてボロンタルの宝物であるリンボトロリンボトコを守ります町下ゴベル財団農家の人々の現地政府とともに人材開発の視点からボロンタルのレッドプロジェクトを支援しております本日はプロダクトのカカオ豆で作った
プロジェクトの学校まで作ったチョコレートを皆さんにすでにお配りしたと思いますがぜひご賞味ください袋に貼り付けた QR コードからプロジェクトのサマリー資料をご覧いただけますまたパナソニックグループのハチバチミツバチミツバチプロジェクトの新商品ここはドリンクマシンもあの外で展示しておりますので披露しておりますのでこのカカ,カカオドリンクもお配りしておりますがあの次のセッションの後にぜひここもあのご賞味いただきたいと思っておりますさてスウェーデンのグレータ・トルベリーさんが COP24 で発表したあの気候,気候変動に関するスピーズをご存知でしょうかあの15歳の彼女は政府に対しまして気候変動対策を認める抗議活動を行っているあの活動家でありますスピーチでは彼女がおばあさんになった時に孫からまだアクションを取る時間があったのになんで何もしなかったんですか子供たちの未来を奪っているのに何を何の行動もしようとしない大人たちをあの糾弾する内容でした彼女が言ってるあの内容で出ますが希望は必要ですがでも希望よりも最も必要なのは何の行動を起こしてるんですかと私たち大人は行動しなければならないマシュタゴベ財団は農家と現地政府と協力して1000万トンの CO2 削減のチャレンジします最後になりますけれどもこのプロジェクトのキーサクセスファクターはやはり SDG ストーリーを背景としたチョコレートの販売でございますこれから私たちは今までのチョコレートと少し違った内容をあの紹介したいと思います健康なチョコレート商品を作ってまいりますぜひ皆さんからの,あのご支援プロジェクトへのご理解とご協力あのいただきますようによろしくお願いいたしますご清聴ありがとうございましたありがとうございましたドクターサントソさんあそう私もチョコレートは大好きなんですけれどもそんなチョコレートをたくさん食べることが特に貧しい人々のために努力しているサントソさんやあの金松株式会社の皆さんのプロジェクトに役に立つということを知ってますますたくさん食べようと思いましたそれでは、uh, The Story Very Important Presentation from Japan International Corporation Agency Mr. Morita Takahiro さん Please, you have a p l a u s Thank you very much and good morning, everybody.、Uh, thank you very much for this very、uh, precious opportunity, and I'm very much honored、uh, to be part of the Global Landscape Forum in Kyoto. And I'm afraid some of you might know about JICA, so I'd like to briefly explain what is all about JICA. So JICA is an implementing agency of Japan's ODA in the form of technical cooperation and grant aid and concessional and loans. We are extending our、uh, cooperation more than 150 countries globally. And then JICA is addressing the issues human security and quality growth. And we would like to contribute to SDGs as well. Why? Because human security and quality growth are deeply incorporated into SDGs concept. And、uh, at the SDGs, we have the 17 goals. That、uh, JICA would like to、uh, focus on 10 goals out of the 17 goals because we would like to make, maximize our experience of international cooperation of more than 60 years. And then I think、uh, we need more innovation and local and international partnerships. Why?、Uh, this graph is、uh, produced by the Columbia University. Um, I might say SDGs a little bit ambitious goal. And if we take the business as usual path, the target would never be reached. So we should change this business as usual path into SDG path. My necessary 
or should necessary. We need some innovation. And this graph shows the financial flows to developing countries. As you can see clearly, the presence of ODA has been decreasing dramatically. But on the contrary, like a foreign direct investment or remittance or a security bond is increasing. So that means the multi-stakeholder partnership is very much important. I think this is not only for JICA but all of you, uh, this is our uh, challenges. Uh, so we have to accelerate innovation and partnerships. So I would like to uh, introduce some example of JICA, what kind of action we have taken. Uh, this is JJ First from the space. Uh, JICA and JAXA utilizing the Japan satellite data and provide the, some uh, large change information uh, through the website for 77 countries, 24 hours. So this is from the space. And this is from the ground. One example, uh, with Kyoto University, we started in Indonesia to establish the pit system and try to improve the livelihood of local communities. Uh, so this is kind of the some grassroots level activities. So we have to combine the top-down approach and the bottom-up approach. And this is for the partnership. Uh, in Japan, to promote the Red Plus, together with uh, FFPRI, we establish the Red Plus platform and invite private sectors, a research institute, NGO, and government. And so far, 85 members have been participated under the Red Plus platform. And locally, here in Kansai, including Kyoto area, JICA and Japanese government and private sector jointly organized this SDGs platform in order to publicize SDGs and foster networking and collaboration. So far, successfully, we invited 654 members uh, under this SDGs platform. So, uh, in closing, I, my message is very simple. So, we need innovation and partnerships. So, I like the uh, catchphrase of this landscape forum, it's not too late. So I would like to add some words. So let's take action now or never. Let's make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Takahiro Morita. It is very, uh, we got to learn what the broader public, general public also can participate in the activities to uh, help support uh, sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. So, because of the time constraints, we supposed to have more panel sessions, but uh, only we have uh, time to take one questions to uh, one of our so, panelists, to Dr. Ditai, uh, Executive Director of ITTO. So I'd like to ask you what things most urgently by forest sectors to do to meet the target of climate change and SDG goals? Uh, thank you very much. Um, there are many things to say, but uh, let me start with the fact that our new thinking in climate change policies and especially through IPCC report last year um, we need to look beyond the forest. Uh, we, we have looked in, in red plus over the last 10-15 years to avoid deforestation, to, to uh, maximize, uh, to improve forest management and so on. But um, the role of the afterlife of trees, the forest products, is as important as what happens in the forest itself through substitution and the, the IPCC made it very clear that we need to move towards a bio-based and circular economy and natural resources, not only trees and forests, 
but also other natural resources products have to play that important role. And that brings us to the point that we need to establish a partnership between the producers of these natural resources in the, in the landscape and those who consume those products on the markets. And I think it is important that consumer countries and consumers develop the demand for legal and sustainable products so that the producers in the forests, in the landscapes, get a clear signal and get encouragement and can direct their investments towards these products. Globally, uh, the trade with, uh, let's say, tropical, for tropical timber is a marginal part of the global trade with timber domestically. And so we have to work through our demand in consumer countries and, and provide incentives to domestic production because 80% of these domestic productions in tropical countries is informal and um, is not regulated very well. And the, the question of governance, the question of land rights, the question of indigenous peoples is, is a prominent question there. So to overcome the gap which I uh, explained before, we need to produce more legally and sustainably. And it requires three key elements. One is good governance and incentives, which where governments have an important role. The second is knowledge, information and access to technologies. In many tropical countries, this is not yet there, uh, starting from management plans, uh, uh, supply chain uh, 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 requirements and things like that. And the third part is access to finance. And I think if you have the first two, access to finance and verified production is more profitable and finance will come more easily. I think with that, um, I would like to stop because there is much more to say, but I think that's from my point of view the key challenges. Yes, forests and natural resources have uh, a huge importance for achieving the global climate goals in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dutai. So still, uh, there are a lot of things we, all of our panelists, would like to talk with you, audience. So, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have time. So, uh, please visit our booth that is located just outside of the door. And uh, after the door, so on the left side, there is our booth. And uh, as uh, Papa Santoso indicated that, there is a chocolate machine, the chocolate drink machine. <laughs> so, so, if you drink more chocolate, you can save more forest and uh, we can uh, save people's life from poverty. So uh, we uh, would like to uh, so say uh, goodbye. But before finishing our session, I have just to, would like to inform you a small memorial booth of our colleague, Mr. Satoshi Akahori, set at the table top exhibition area. Uh, many of you, uh, colleagues, knows Mr. Akahori had worked for climate change and forest carbon sink issues as one of the delegations of the Forestry Agency of Japan, including for UNFCCC negotiations for a long time, since 1998. He left us last year at his age of 56. We will be so thankful to you if you write your message for his family on the notebook placed at the memorial booth. Thank you very much for your kind cooperation. So thank you very much, delegates, and uh, thank you very much all of you in the hall, and uh, thank you those listening to us online. Some, somewhere on the earth, thank you she falls, Dr. Nashi, Dr. Naito, and uh, all of the other staff. Please give all of you a big applause. Thank you very much.